a journalist once uh, approached Einstein with the with the question, assuming Einstein would have been very proud of nuclear power because it was a peaceful use of nuclear. And Einstein smiled and said, uh, it's a hell of a way to boil water. Yeah, that's now, right. The, it's a massive Rube Goldberg way to boil water. One it, of the most complicated ways mankind has ever designed, devised is, to burn. Yes, but there's more to that. Mm -hmm. if, if I, for example, went out in the backyard, took a large pot, and boiled an equivalent amount of water with heat from a fire that could be produced with heat in a, in a power plant in a single day, I could boil water. In a year, you'd find the ashes. Ten years, you might. A hundred, you won't. A thousand or ten thousand or a million, you'll never find where I boiled the water. But the same amount of water boiled for a single day with nuclear power, four and a half billion years later, you can find that material is still half as effective as it was before. Uh, I, I contend that's nuts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So other than the former head of the NRC, do you see anything, because you follow this issue very closely, do you see anybody else calling for massive rethinking of the nuclear power industry? Oh, there's a lot of people, a lot of environmentalists are calling for that. There's a lot of, uh, for, for example, <coughs> I know I, I was on um, um, uh, the power of Joyce Riley and with, with uh, Mr. Gunderson, and we were talking about that kind of thing, and it's, it's the type of insanity that we need to get a hold of, and we need to get a hold of it quick. And Ar Arne Gunderson has that opinion as well. It's just like it's an insane thing to do, and he used to be an insider who, who worked on these things and designed these kinds of pieces of equipment. I just recently went to a fair where they were talking about solar power for your own backyard and a lot of other things, and they had a guy up there telling everyone that it was a real tragedy that we weren't moving to nuclear power, that some environmentalist groups had opposed nuclear power and that was going to destroy the planet because of carbon dioxide. <laughs> I mean, do you find that credible? That they would accept things like plutonium, depleted uranium, and yet choke on the idea that carbon dioxide is here, even though the plants can dispose of that. There's nothing that thrives or disposes of plutonium or depleted uranium. No, I find that ludicrous. I, th I think those people are completely crazy. That makes no sense at all. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked mm -hmm. by that. Yeah, but I have seen that. I've actually seen environmentalist sites saying that uh, nuclear energy is better than solar because it has less of a carbon footprint. And they talk about creating solar panels and how much energy that takes. I mean, that's their calculus. They, they, they start from a false assumption that carbon dioxide is the most dangerous thing on the planet, which is demonstrably false. And then they extrapolate it back from that to say that the best, cleanest form of energy is nuclear. So that was my concern about it. I'm hoping that, that people will, will see the other side of this equation, really understand what's dangerous about these substances. I'm sorry. I guess I'm a conspiracy theorist. I'd say follow the money. Who paid them? That's right. You know, I'm, right. I'm suspicious of anybody who's that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of people that are, and unfortunately, they've convinced a lot of grassroots people of that, too. Well, thank you so much for speaking about that. Again, your website is FukushimaUpdateReport.com. It's an aggregated site of information about Fukushima, which just keeps going. We're coming up to the third year anniversary. Thank you so much for telling us how to assess some of these, uh, well, actually, I guess we don't really have a good way to assess the danger, do we? That's really the takeaway, so. isn't it? I don't think we yeah. do. Uh, we can't believe what the government says. We uh, have no reliable institution anymore that would give us honest answers, and that's the sad part about it. Uh, how bad it is here with that, it is millions of times worse in Japan in the sense that those people don't have anybody to speak the truth to them at all. Uh, there's millions of children that are, have, have pre-lesion cancer mm -hmm. lesions on their thyroid now when they could have spent less than $10 million handing out some iodine tablets yes. to the entire country and no one would be affected. And it's not just now. the Japanese government, it's the American government as well. They could have given those soldiers on the USS Reagan Good iodine Lord, tablets. Yes. I mean, that's... that's <coughs> That's a war crime there. So it's very difficult to know exactly what your radiation exposure is. And there's a few things that you can do to mitigate the damage to it, like iodine, other things. But basically, it's very pessimistic if we don't get the nuclear power industry under control, would you say? I'd say it is. I, this is the kind of thing where it's kind of a doomsday situation. And people have asked me if, if it's such a doomsday scenario, 
How do you deal with it? How, how, how do you possibly deal with, with something like that, that a Carrington event could wipe us out? And I said, well, it comes back to my, uh, my faith. It comes back to the idea that God gave us something, and it's life, it's a gift, but, but he put physics restraints on it. And my friend says, physics, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? And I said, well, God kind of knew what he was doing. He says, look, you can't live yesterday, and you can't live tomorrow. You can only live today. So my attitude is, okay, if I, if I live today, I look outside and the sun's shining and the birds are chirping and I can look at my wife and have a, a wonderful day. I live that day as though it may even be my last day and I enjoy that day to its fullest. And then the next morning when I wake up and it's another wonderful day, I do the same thing. Because really all we can do is live each day the very best we can. And um, like I told a friend of mine, if you didn't kiss your wife goodbye going to work, shame on you. <laughs> That's really well put. I want to talk about a little bit about this book because and the plot of this book. You've got a book there of short stories. You're also sure. an author besides a scientist and inventor. This book here, let me get this here so they can get it on the camera. Tell us a little bit about this book. It's a fiction book. Yes, it's uh, it literally is something I dreamed. It's kind of strange in that sense, but this is a uh, a type of story that questions who has the right to own another human being or patent a human being. It's a um, it's an expose, so to speak, into a, a, almost an allegory uh, about right and wrong in that the government wanted to create the super soldiers and were creating some kind of synthetic DNA to modify human DNA and extra chromosomes. It didn't work. And only two people survived out of 2,500 uh, implanted embryos, and it was a horrible disaster. But the two people that survived were very, very unique. And um, this is their story about how they have to play a cat and mouse game with the with the government and get away from them because they are considered lab rats. Mm. They're not considered human beings mm. because their DNA is patented. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't buy that. I don't buy the idea that somebody can patent DNA and own another human being, but that's what it's coming to. Oh, we're that we're, close away we're, from it. We're, we're very close to it. And when they could patent the genes uh, for that breast cancer test, uh, fortunately that got struck down, but we also see what's happening with GMO patents from Monsanto where they can claim that if they trespass, essentially cross-pollinating onto somebody else's field, they can claim that as copyright infringement, even though it's really fundamentally a trespass. They're polluting somebody else's field. I you have, have so. Mm -hmm. I have this one question, David. When do we say that the ends do not justify the means? Is there any with that kind of courage? Perhaps it must ultimately and sadly fall to those exploited by the game gone mad. That's the ultimate question, isn't it? Yes. We see that question so many times. We need to ask that question to the engineers who start following down these dark paths without ever looking at the ethics or where this is going to ultimately lead. They're simply interested in solving the puzzle that's put in front of them yeah. or getting the gold ring or the money or the award, whatever it is that motivates them, but they're not looking at the long-term consequences or the ethics. And that applies not just to the nuclear industry or the, or the DNA industry, the, the biological industry, but it also applies to people who work for DARPA. We see oh, some absolutely. horrible stuff that could possibly come down the pike from that, and we've talked about that many times. You have so many different things in your background that we could talk to you about. We could go on forever, but Thank we're you. out of time. Thank you for coming in and talking to us. It's been really wonderful meeting Thank you. Thank you, you kindly. Mr. Thank you very much. And again, that website that he has is FukushimaUpdateReport.com. And if you want updates, not only on Fukushima, but everything that's happening in America, the police state, environmental issues, stay tuned to Prison Planet TV. Support us as a subscriber. Your subscription can be shared with up to 10 other people at the same time. It's a great way to spread the information and to support our operation here. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show.